Today, we're going to talk about the HIV genome and life cycle. So the HIV genome is a single-stranded RNA and contains nine genes. We will explore the functions of all the genes. But first, let's take a look at how HIV integrates itself into the host cell. So first, we have the five prime and three prime long terminal repeats that flank the ends of the HIV genome. LTRs are found on all retroviral genomes and are important for turning the RNA into DNA, as we will see. And within the five prime LTR and three prime LTR is the U5 and U3 region, respectively. They impact gene expression and are the sites for many transcription factors. Right next to the U5 region is the primer binding site, and it's where the primer will first bind. In this case, HIV uses the three prime end of lysine tRNA as a primer. And next to the U3 region is the polypurin tract, which acts as the primer for the plus strand DNA that's generated. Plus strand basically means that the DNA nucleotide sequence corresponds directly to the sequence of the RNA. So, lysine tRNA has now binded to the PBS due to complementary base pairing, and also reverse transcriptase has been recruited. Reverse transcriptase is an enzyme that generates complementary DNA from an RNA template. Reverse transcriptase has three enzymatic activities, which is a DNA-based DNA polymerase and RNA-based DNA polymerase and an RNase, which degrades RNA. We'll see all three in action right here. So here we see the RNA-based DNA polymerase activity. When reverse transcriptase copies the 5' prime LTR and the U5 region into cDNA, now reverse transcriptase will degrade the RNA 5' prime LTR and U5 region via its RNase H component. Remember that both the 5' prime LTR and 3' prime LTR are identical to each other, meaning they can complementarily bind to each other which is exactly what the cDNA's 5' prime LTR is going to do when it binds to the RNA's 3' prime LTR. And this now leaves a U5 overhang at the 5' prime end of the cDNA. And just remember that the tRNA is complementary to the PBS site. Reverse transcriptase will then copy the rest of the RNA genome into its first cDNA strand. At this point, all the RNA has been copied into DNA. So reverse transcriptase will degrade the remaining RNA, except for the PPT site. And now, as I've mentioned earlier, PPT will act as a primer for the second cDNA strand. Here, we'll see reverse transcriptase's DNA-based DNA polymerase activity. Since the tRNA is complementary to PBS, the end of the newly synthesized cDNA will be PBS. Next, the PPT is degraded by RNase H activity. At this point, all RNA has been degraded. So since both cDNA strands have a, have a PBS site, they can bind to each other. And now reverse transcriptase will finish copying the whole genome into DNA. The completed DNA genome is not exactly the same as the original RNA genome, however. Since U3 and U5 are flanking the ends rather than the original 3' prime LTR and 5' prime LTR, respectively, but the cDNA strands are identical to each other. Next, the HIV genome must be integrated into the host cell's genome. This is accomplished largely by an HIV enzyme called integrase. Integrase dimers will bind to the ends of the HIV genome, which causes the DNA to take up a circular conformation. Other proteins, such as the HIV protein VPR, associate with integrase to form a pre-initiation complex. Now the complex will enter the nucleus via a nu nuclear pore complex. Before integrating into the host DNA, integrase does something called 3' prime processing. Essentially, integrase removes 2 to 3 nucleotides from the 3' prime ends of the HIV genome to expose a conserved terminal cytosine. Adenine dinucleotide and then the 3' prime end undergoes a nucleophilic attack to produce an OH group using water. The 3' prime OH group will be used later to attack the phosphodiester bonds on the host DNA. Once 3' prime processing is complete, integrase will make a staggered cut, which is around a 4-6 base pair difference and connect the three prime ends of the HIV DNA to the five prime ends of the host cell DNA. But there are now gaps at the five prime ends of the HIV DNA. So gap repair proteins from the host cell will fill in these gaps via gap repair synthesis. First, two nucleotides at the ends of five prime HIV DNA are cleaved off. And it's good to note that these denucleotides never base paired with the host DNA in the first place. And now that the HIV genome has fully integrated itself into the host cell, it's now referred to as a provirus. HIV can remain dormant for years and only becomes highly active during the right conditions. So we're going to take a look at what happens when HIV DNA is expressed. NF-kappa B is a particularly important transcription factor for HIV and helps recruit RNA polymerase 2 to transcribe the virus genome. It's usually present in an inactive form in the cytosol of T cells. But when an antigen binds to AT cell receptor, this initiates a signal cascade that activates NF-kappa B and facilitates its movement into the nucleus. In this way, T cells that are currently fighting infection are most likely to produce HIV particles and get killed. 
and HIV only has one transcription unit, so RNA polymerase produces a single unspliced version of the HIV genome. HIV mRNA can actually be spliced in over 30 different ways, but we're going to sort them in three classes for simplicity, unspliced, singly sliced, and fully spliced mRNA. The unspliced mRNA cannot exit the nucleus because it's bound to a spliceosome. Spliceosomes are RNA protein complexes that cut mRNA so that they can form the correct protein. Usually, the cell can detect when an mRNA is not fully spliced and keeps it in the nucleus. Even when the HIV mRNA is singly spliced, it still cannot exit the nucleus. Only when HIV mRNA is fully spliced can it finally exit the nucleus and begin translation. The protein products that can be made from fully spliced HIV mRNA are NEF, REV, and TAT. NEF helps to promote virion infectivity by preventing the transport of several host proteins to the plasma membrane. For example, it induces the endocytosis of MHC1, which is a cell surface protein that displays peptide fragments of proteins from within the cell to cytotoxic T cells that trigger an immune response. So when these receptors are unavailable, the immune system does not know that a cell is under attack. Also, NEF down regulates CD4, which is a co-receptor needed for initiating HIV infection on helper T cells. And by down-regulating, it helps to prevent superinfection so that HIV doesn't kill its host too quickly. The other two proteins, TAT and REV, do not stay in the cytosol and instead go back into the nucleus where they function. TAT greatly increases the level of transcription of the HIV provirus, such as by helping to hyperphosphorylate RNA polymerase 2 and recruiting histone acetyltransferases to provide an optimal environment for transcription. Without TAT, initial rounds of transcription are extremely limited. As we saw earlier, HIV mRNA that is not fully spliced can't exit the nucleus, but REV allows these incompletely processed mRNA strands to exit. After translation and nuclear import of REV, REV binds to the REV response element sequence in unspliced HIV RNA. REV then associates with exportin 1, also known as CRM1, resulting in the export of the larger unspliced and singly spliced HIV mRNA through the nuclear pore complex without the assistance of NXF1 slash NXD1, which is the primary exporter protein for MSRNA. So now that the incompletely spliced HIV mRNAs are in the cytosol, they can be translated into their protein products. Let's take a look at what singly sliced mRNA can produce. There are four different protein products from singly spliced mRNA, VIF, ENV, VPU, and VPR. VIF counteracts Apobec enzymes, which basically turn cytidines into uridines in DNA and hypermutate genes. VIF degrades these lethal enzymes and prevents their incorporation into progeny variants. As briefly mentioned earlier, VPR helps integrate HIV C DNA into the host cell, but it also induces host cell G2 arrest, stopping cell division in the G2M checkpoint, and this halt eventually causes the lymphocyte to go into apoptosis, which is the most likely cause of AIDS. And ENV and VPU go to the ER. So ENV is initially translated into glycoprotein 160, but is then cleaved by furin, a host cell protein, into GT41 and GTP120. These are the spikes seen on the outside of the virus envelope. GT120 interacts with the co-receptor CD4 during initial infection and creates a high affinity binding site for chemokine entry receptors like CCR5 and CXCR4, which then allow HIV entry into the cell. VPU is involved in CD4 degradation by mediating ubiquitin proteasome interaction, which helps prevent superinfection along with nephrin. Additionally, VPU promotes budding by inhibiting tetherin. When VPU is not present, tetherin binds to the viral envelope and prevents its release from the cell. But when VIPU inhibits it, immature HIV particles can be released. So ENV and VPU are processed and eventually end up at the plasma membrane. Now let's take a look at the unspliced mRNA. So this mRNA produces GAG, and GAG is actually a multi-protein product that will later get cleaved by HIV's protein, ACE, during virus maturation. There are four domains in GAG, matrix protein, capsid protein, nucleocapsid protein, and P6 protein, and we'll see how they interact with the virus later. What may surprise you is that there's actually a second protein product that can be made from identically unspliced mRNA. It's called the GAG-pole polyprotein. 
and this is able to be produced because on rare occasions, the stop codon at the end of gag is not recognized and the read-through product is gag pole. But since this is pretty rare, the amount of gag pole is much less than gag itself. Both gag and gag pole are incorporated into the final HIV particle and modified as we will see next. During maturation, HIV protease cleaves gag and pole. The matrix domain binds to the plasma membrane in GP41. The capsid domain forms a cone-shaped shell that protects the RNA and associated proteins and also safely delivers them to the host nucleus during infection. The nucleocapsid domain captures the RNA genome. And finally, the PA6 domain contains binding sites for proteins such as VPR. It also helps with HIV's escort-dependent budding alon with VEPU. Hello, this is the creator. This is my first time using a text-to-speech software, so I apologize if there's any mispronunciations. But I hope you guys learned something from this video, and thank you for watching.